Hello, and welcome to our webinar today, How to Get There Faster, New Approaches to Closing Critical Leadership Gaps to Accelerate Performance. My name is Melissa Fitzpatrick, and I'm the president of Kirby Bates Associates. We are a healthcare executive search firm, placing healthcare leaders all across the country, all across the continuum of care in both permanent and interim roles. And it's a pleasure today to host this webinar with some phenomenal colleagues who I'll get to introduce you to in just a moment. First off, I wanted you to know that we are having this disclosure statement to let you know that this, this webinar is accredited by the American Nurses Credentialing Center, their Commission on Accreditation. So for all the hundreds, yes, we have hundreds of people online with us today, the hundreds of nurses that are participating, you will be receiving one contact hour from ANCC for, for your participation today. We have several objectives that we wanna to meet today while we're together. The first is we're going to describe how an organization benefits from supporting internal career progression. Everybody is focusing on internal career progression today as their organizations are going through so much churn, so much change. So you'll hear a lot about internal career progression today. We're also gonna make it clear the value of this one-on-one, -on -one, in-person and virtual leadership advising as an adjunct to other methods of continuous improvement and learning, in, in, including online learning. And certainly we wanna spend a little time hearing from our panelists about the difference between having a coach engaged with them versus having an executive advisor. That might just sound like semantics to some of you, but in fact, using the right language can be very important in really promoting the success of this program. Now, I also wanted to be sure that you understood some of the language that you'll be hearing, and this is in relation to the program that we will be explaining to you. This is the Kirby Bates Nurse Executive Advisory Service that has pulled together this ANCC accredited program called the Nurse Executive Gateway to Knowledge. This is an evidence-based curriculum that our panelists will be talking with you about, again, accredited by ANCC. You'll be hearing about the various domains within the program and how this program is customized to each advisee in collaboration with each advisor. So you'll hear about some of the, the spheres of transformation and as the program is customized to each individual, it can also then be expanded to be included for their team and for their organization. And we'll be sharing with you today specific examples of results that have been achieved as this model and framework have been uh, brought to bear at an individual leader level, but then also for their teams and across their organizations. So now let's get to our wonderful panelists who are joining me today. It really is a pleasure to have two of our Kirby Bates executive advisors with us, both Deb Stamps and Pam Hunt. And we've got two of their advisees with us, Chris Chasen and Missy Hockaday. So we'll be hearing from two different um, examples of using the Nurse Executive Gateway to, to Knowledge Program, one from Maine and one from Indianapolis, Indiana. So let's start with some specific introductions. Chris, do you wanna take a moment and, and tell us about yourself and how you've used the Gateway to Knowledge Program in your leadership journey? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Chasen, and I'm currently the Chief Nursing Officer at Central Maine Healthcare here in Lewiston, Maine. It's pretty out there, not too sunny, but lots of turning leaves. Um, so I, my career in leadership is really around service line leadership for the last 20 years. And about four years ago, three years ago, I had the opportunity to be promoted internally at Central Maine Medical Center um, in the role of the Vice President of Nursing and Patient Care Services. And at the time, we were also, I was also fortunate to be dealing with a new president of our hospital. And he was very supportive and really wanted to make sure that I was successful and wanted to engage a, an advisor for me. We coincidentally you know, reached out to Kirby Bates because we had been working with them as an organization to begin with. And um, we were lucky that they were trying to pilot this new program. So I was actually the first candidate to go through this Nursing Gateway to Excellence performance um, pilot. 
And during that time, um, it was very much welcomed. I wanted to make sure that I had the ability to work within a new senior team that was, was turning over at the time as well. And this gave me all the tools that I needed to work that way. We learned a lot through your experience. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Missy, our <laughs> other advisee who's on our panel today, Missy Hockaday. Um, I work at IU Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. I've been with that health organization for 21 years now. Uh, my background is uh, trauma and critical care, which you'll hear uh, some of my challenges in that space. Uh, I tend to move fast and make decisions quickly, and so um, and I execute. And so uh, in an executive role, that can be a challenge. Um, and so um, that's the value that Kirby Bates brought to me. Um, and so my current role uh, is very unique in the health system. So I work um, on the medical group side. We have five medical groups that are going, going to join into one. I am the chief nursing officer for ambulatory. I'm the vice president for advanced practice. And then I um, also have a role on the health system side uh, doing care transitions. So anything related to patient flow, uh, care transitions from inpatient to outpatient, our favorite two topics linked to stay and readmission are two of my biggest projects that I'm working on right now. And I think, uh, you know, the reason that I was um, brought forward to this role was this is a unique role to our health system and it's unique across the country. Um, it's very challenging. You know, we I sit at the system level and we have regional leadership teams. And so making sure that I'm set up for success uh, for a very complex role that sits between two business units uh, is challenging. Um, I've had several roles in my career that were new roles, but this one uh, was very unique. And so my leader is both the chief nursing executive for the system and the chief medical uh, executive for the system said, we would love for you to join uh, this nurse executive gateway to knowledge program uh, to continue to develop your leadership. Thank you. And we're so glad they did. Thanks, Chris and Missy. Now we're going to pivot a bit and meet our Kirby Bates uh, nurse executive advisors. Um, let's hear some of your backgrounds and also what draw you into this, what drew you into this advising role because you're both so good at it. Deb Stamps, can we start with you, my friend? Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deb Stamps. I am a nurse executive advisor here at Kirby Bates. I have over 30 years of experience in the healthcare industry. I've had the privilege and honor of serving in various uh, leadership roles in nursing. Uh, before stepping into this advisory position. I've held positions such as a regional chief nursing officer, vice president for quality, patient safety, and innovation. I've been the founding president of the Rochester General College of Health Careers and the inaugural chief diversity officer. I have never felt in my uh, 30 plus years that I've gone to work. I've always brought my passions um, together. Uh, doing what I love and what makes a difference in the communities. I'm passionate about advising and the opportunity to leverage my experiences to foster inclusion, belonging, growth, innovation, and excellence in healthcare organizations through nursing leadership. My journey has taught me the significance of providing high quality, culturally responsive patient care, and also nurturing a conducive um, environment for healthcare professionals to thrive, never lo losing sight of the organizational's goals. And through sharing my experiences and lessons I've learned, I'm ultimately making a difference and impact for many, opening the doors and changing many lives. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, so glad you're here. Now, Pam, you and I have known each other a very long time, back to my days as president of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. We have spoken together. We have written together. I know your passion for leading and your passion for developing others. So please take a moment to introduce yourselves, Pam, yourself, Pam Hunt. Melissa's right. We have known each other for a very long time. And when you look at your nursing career, uh, that's actually a, a very satisfying part of being where I am today in this career. So my journey, much like what you heard from Deb, I uh, was a hospital operator for 40 years of my career with 33 of those years being in a leadership position. I started as a critical care nurse and then was leader of critical care. I was uh, offered a perioperative position back in the day when we were doing downsizing and uh, it was uncommon for leaders to be 
leaders in areas that they were not clinically competent in. And uh, throughout that, those years of progressive leadership, I served the last eight years of my career as a regional chief nurse executive. So uh, this, and, and through that, when, as I was in those leadership roles, I had the opportunity to really see a lot of leaders grow, develop, and actually become either directors or chief nurses, or I, I mentored a pharmacist uh, for several years, and he is now director, system director of pharmacy. So when I was ready to leave the inpatient world and the, um, getting called at three o'clock in the morning to ask if we could go on diversion, I don't <laughs> know if that speaks to any of you, but when I was ready to leave that work, this was a perfect fit. And uh, Chris and I were the pilot program. Uh, we learned this work together and learned, you know, what worked and what maybe didn't work, work and that what we could do uh, differently together. But boy, uh, you know, I, I told Chris several times, I still tell Chris this, uh, I will tell you what I did right and why it worked out well. And I will also share with you what I did wrong or what I did and it didn't work out so well. And I think that's one of the beauty, beautiful things about this program is as an advisor, I don't have, um, you know, Chris doesn't report to me. We have a professional relationship and my goal is for she and the organization to be successful. That's it. And uh, I wish, I wish, that I had had somebody like me be uh, my advisor when I was in that operational role, because what I learned was how differently things look through your eyes when you don't own it, and you're you are you're not positioning yourself in any way uh, in the organization. Mm -hmm. You can see things much clearer. And we'll talk about that later on in the webinar together. So, uh, you know, I came to this work with lots of experience, both successful and not so successful. I think that's really, really important. And Chris and I learned to capitalize on those experiences together. Thanks so much, Pam. I think what our audience is really going to appreciate I know I appreciate the transparency that you're gonna hear from each of our panelists. As you've heard, we've got two groups. We've got uh, the group that's been together, advisor and advisee at Central Maine, and we've got the advisor and advisee in Indianapolis. And they've had different experiences using the same program. The program is very flexible and can be adapted to whatever's going on either with that individual advisee the team, the organization, both organizations were in some very different situations facing different challenges. So I think you're going to be uh, impressed as I am with the transparency that each of our panelists will bring to the conversation. And I know that their stories will resonate with the hundreds of people in our audiences because every one of you out there I know is going through these same challenges of workforce, of ethics, of post-pandemic life, all of the things that you're struggling with to lead in vulnerable and chaotic and vol volatile times. So let's continue that conversation. Uh, Chris, we'll go back to you. We'll, we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into each of the situations that the teams found themselves in within these two different and diverse organizations. We'll have Chris and Pam talk a little bit more in depth about how they got started using the Nurse Executive Gateway to Knowledge within the Central Maine Health System. And uh, Chris, we'll start with you and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Pam again. All right, sounds great. Thank you, Melissa. So um, Pam and I got to get our start together right in the middle of the pandemic, right? right? Well, actually probably in the beginning, it was in the fall of 2020. And so we were able to squeeze in an on-site visit uh, before everything sort of shut down and we weren't allowed visitors. Uh, so that worked out great. Uh, what I appreciated the most about working with somebody like Pam, um, coming from the same world, similar to M Missy, when you have critical care and procedural background, 
I walk fast, I talk fast, <laughs> I make decisions fast. And, you know, she was very quick to hold the mirror up to me because <laughs> she had the same one um, and share that, you know, I, I needed to pause. I needed to pause for reflection. I needed to compliment more. I needed to be a little bit more engaging with our stakeholders. And even if I knew exactly where I was going, I was supposed to still <laughs> Um, bring the team with me, I guess, is what, uh, that was the biggest component of that. Um, she had me pegged from the beginning in terms of, I needed to learn the art of humble inquiry. And uh, she went so far as to send me a book to my home address uh, to read around humble inquiry, which I've since then passed along to my um, my boss at the time. And he was grateful because he he was sort of sewn from the same cloth I was. So he was appreciative of that. Um, you know, having somebody on site, having, um, being able to read the room when you're in the room was very helpful, um, uh, giving some insight to some of the body language and just the interpretations that go on around you when you're trying to present your agenda on something. Um, she was able to, you know, bring that to light in a way that I probably wouldn't have appreciated given my, my desire to do well and succeed and get my point across in those first initial meetings. So uh, I was grateful for those insights at the time. That's great, Chris. And, and Pam, you've had so many experiences really across the country in so many different ways. What was it about the Nurse Executive Gateway to Knowledge program? But then also, how did you kind of do that dance around the coach versus the advisor, because it was very effective the way you and Chris worked this out within the organization. At the same time that I started working with Chris, I was actually working on a, a, in a doctorate program and I was doing work of the most effective way to learn and most effective way to learn and especially to learn and actually transform behavior is both in, in a, um, in a formal, what we would more consider a formal way, but also in an experiential way. When Chris and I started working together, and I'll talk about a couple of different textbooks, and we'll talk about this more later on that we used, but we did a, a True North. We went through a, two nor a True North uh, textbook, and as well as a financial uh, management textbook. We would be able to talk about that content and then relate it to what we saw in her work environment, which, which made it so rich. You know, it was not only the content, but then, okay, let's talk about um, how we relate this. And, and to Chris's uh, point about being on site, it was very valuable for your advisor to be on site at least a couple of times. There's nothing like getting the lay of the land, meeting people, seeing interactions, just as Chris said, of, of people in the room to be able to help that advisee to navigate that the, the relationships in the organization. And I was able to, in my position, be very open, very transparent, very honest with Chris there is no authority gradient in this relationship. I'm not doing Chris's evaluation. Uh, you know, I, I uh, when I met, I do have touch bases with her CEO, but you know, we talk at a very high level. We don't, I, I don't share with that person the, the ins and outs of what Chris and I talk about because that is confidential. So therefore, Chris and I could establish uh, a really strong, trusting relationship of when she was frustrated, uh, you know, coming to me, let's talk through this. And, you know, there's times, and Chris, you're probably going to smile. Uh, there's times I'd say, mm, I know this isn't going to feel good, but this is how I think you should approach this. Because again, those outside eyes, you know, and not, not having a uh, knowing the political climate, but not having um, that silo that sometimes is a barrier to many of us in executive positions. So we did customize the program, Chris and I. There were some things that we moved forward because they were kind of bubbling up and we wanted to move them forward. Uh, we, we got through 100% of the content, 
but there were some things we moved forward, some things we moved backward according to what was going on in the organization. Uh, Melissa, you mentioned something, and I do want to take a minute to mention that to the group. Chris and I both, as well as Kirby Bates, even before I met Chris, we were very intentional about what we were going to call this role. Mm -hmm. And there is some connotation out there, I would argue shouldn't be, but there is some connotation out there in our business that says, if I have a coach, I must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. That, you know, there's there's something, I, I have an opportunity for improvement. So uh, the, the program, the Gateway uh, Executive Advisor Program is advisor intentionally instead of coach, mm -hmm. because that is a, a, a better description of what we do. And when Chris and I were together, especially when we were first uh, together and my first visit there at Central Maine, we were very intentional about introducing me as Chris's advisor. And now we've been together for so long that I was just I was just on site with her on Monday. So um, we've been together so long that I walk in and and it's you know everyone greets me and welcomes me and. And uh, they know our relationship together. It's not, I wasn't brought in because Chris wasn't doing something right. I was brought in as a, as a support and help her integrate into that executive role. Exactly, Pam. And as a matter of fact, I had, I was the one that engaged with the CEO at the time. And uh, this is a big factor in internal career progression. We all want to try to promote from within. We've, we've done a lot to encourage that culture building and to maintain that organizational memory, that institutional knowledge that our long-term employees have. And yet they might not be all the way ready for that next step, but we're going to do it. And I remember talking specifically with the CEO about he was nervous about using that term coach. And I said, it's really an executive advisor, somebody that can walk that path with Chris, but what an investment you're making in, in this case, Chris and in Missy, these are great investments in our future. And when you turn that table from, oh, is this a coach? Is this remedial? Do they need help? To we are making the best investment possible in this incredible a future that we are laying out for our for our organization and it does kind of really change the whole dynamic i think within the organization so great okay thanks chris and missy I, listen to me chris and pam now missy and deb we're going to go across the heartland we're going to go into indiana and i know that this has been some of the considerations that you've both brought into the engagement uh to support missy on this next level of her journey missy you want to tell us a little bit more about that yeah, I want to speak a little bit to what Pam was talking about. So we had the same interaction in my organization. I was uh, working with a couple of physician leaders and, and they heard I had an executive coach and uh, that was the term they were using. And we thought you were always a top performer. Why do you have a coach? I don't understand. And it was really the chief nursing executive who said, no, this is really about executive advising. This is really about how do we get Missy to the next level? How do we get her ready for another senior level role? Um, in our organization, we want to develop our internal talent. So how do we continue to develop her? It's getting her the resources and tools that she needs to lead this complex role. And so I think that was really important point that Pam made um, that our top talent can have an executive coach. Because um, I think that's really important uh, to have somebody that you can uh, bring issues to, have those confidential conversations, somebody that will call you out on things that you're doing. Um, I would agree that the on-site visits were critical. Obviously, the materials, the books are great. The online platform, the learning platform was phenomenal. But having Deb on site with me was really important. Things that I did not notice I did because I move at Chris's speed. Um, I In every 360 evaluation that I have, I move too fast. I make decisions too fast, and I don't bring along my team. And so I have to be very careful um, from the clinical world. People... Uh, bleed, you got to stop the bleeding. You don't have time to think. But in a leadership role, not everything's that critical. Um, I think obviously during the pandemic, we, we were in that mode, but um, not typically in a day-to-day. -day. And I think one of the things, just a, a, a good example of, of Deb is we were having COVID vaccine errors across our medical groups. So we have five medical groups. We're going to become one soon. 
And we were um, had two different formularies. We had Pfizer, we had Moderna. We were having a lot of vaccine errors, a lot of medical assistants who were, who were um, having some errors. And so we pulled a team together and said, hey, across all the medical groups, let's have a strike team. Who's going to lead it? Well, obviously the ambulatory CNO. I'm in charge of quality. So we pulled a team together and said, look, what can we do differently? We need to re-educate. We need to train. We need to have power plans. We need to remove one of our vaccines off the formulary to do some standardization. All these things, which were very uh, complex things that needed to occur in an organization. And we got done with the meeting and Deb looked at me and she said, that was a great meeting, but you took the minutes. There were 20 other people on the call and out of the 10 action items, you have five of them. Now, how are you going to do that and lead advanced practice and do readmissions and link stay like who on that meeting has the skill set and the authority to complete these tasks? And so just really helping me, you know, to me, it was a crisis. I, I know how to get this work done. I can do these things. I can take minutes. But it was really just stepping back saying, okay, let's pause. Kind of like what Chris said, let's pause. And who else has this capability? You know, I teach coaching and mentoring at our organization and how to teach your team members how to fish, but I was not doing it myself, right? And it's because I couldn't see what I was doing. And so I think that was really important for her to kind of slow me down um, and to think about what I could do differently next time. Well, that's, that's, I think care. every critical care nurse, every trauma and ED nurse on in the audience is relating to this right now because we all talk too fast, walk too fast, decide too fast and all that. So I think that was very uh, honest of you to share that. And also a, a shout out to your uh, chief, your chief nurse executive, uh, Jason Gilbert, because honestly, we all need allies. We all need sponsors. And it could be the CEO who is sponsoring this growth and development. It could be your uh, system chief nurse. And I think we've seen some great examples of that. So thanks, Missy. Now, now, Deb, I know just you mentioned the, the pandemic. I know a lot of this work started for us at Kirby Bates with all of you during the pandemic. And back then in October of 2019, Deb, you had written an article in Nursing Management Journal based on your work at Rochester Regional about a model to streamline career progression for nurse managers, as well as um, the emerging nurse leader. So you were unfolding and unpacking this framework with Missy, hand in glove in Indianapolis, as a lot of this was unfolding. How did that all play out for you in real life, in real time, with all of the challenges that the, that the pandemic brought? Thank you, Melissa. There are, first and foremost, the Nurse Executive Gateway to Knowledge program is evidence-based. Um, it uses evidence-based strategies, and those strategies can be um, molded, um, finessed to meet the needs of the individual that I'm advising, in this case, Missy. Um, the article was published at a time, and since that publication, we've had a lot of challenges. Um, and opportunities, resilience, uh, team, um, how do we continue to do more with less, um, all of the challenges uh, financially that health systems are facing. Um, however, the Kirby Bates um, Nurse Executive Gateway to ne uh, Leadership Program encompasses pre-established objectives, and then we personalize them to the nurse executive. And the focus, there's four main areas of focus. It's ensuring that the nurse executive is knowledgeable um, regarding executive mm -hmm. leadership to address and navigate the ever-changing landscape. We've gone through a pandemic, We've, we're post-pandemic, but now there's even more challenges, more shifting in resources. Um, we also have the ability with nurse executives to be able to ensure that they can transfer the essential knowledge to lead their teams and ensure organizational success. We can't keep all of the, um, the shoulders, the heads, the bodies of the nurse executive will just explode if we don't continue to develop the bench strength and develop your, your leaders uh, to rise to the occasion to be able to execute on what's needed for the organizational outcomes. The evidence-based executive leadership program and the um, advisor role are critical. We actually integrate and we become partners. It's not, I direct Missy to do A, B, C, or D. Um, we have great conversations. We, and you know what's really interesting? 
Missy has the answers. She knows. It's really having that confidence to say, hey, yes, I, I, I got this. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the team. I'm thinking about the outcomes. Um, and it's really about that application. The other critical piece, and, and I'll share a, a brief uh, story, um, is the financial management. Um, you know, nurse le executives have to be able to have the business acumen, be able to have the conversations and dialogue with their CFO. And for instance, uh, Missy and I were working on a SWOT analysis regarding um, her CFO. And it was really interesting because we, we, we had the, evalu the, the analysis complete. We, we talked about it. Missy um, and the CFO met about it. And you know what was the light bulb that went off? There was always this thought that Missy's doing something and the CFO's doing something. But in actuality, they were doing the same things. They had the same goals, but they never communicated. And so when they came together, um, and Missy, you could probably tell the story better than me, um, but it was about that effective communication, ensuring that they had their clear goals and what were the actions that each were working on to achieve those goals, ultimately leading to the um, outcome, the bottom line for the, for the organization financially. Um, but that was sort of the, one of the biggest um, aha moments that we had, um, that we're all on the same bus, uh, um, and we're driving down the road, but we've got to talk to one another um, just to make sure that uh, things run smoothly. And, you know, when I think about the um, the pandemic, it's actually underscored the importance of the nurse executive's leadership role and adaptability, um, ensuring that organizations can effectively respond to ever evolving changes in healthcare. And the Kirby Bates uh, Nurse Executive Gateway to Knowledge Program really is about developing these transferable skills for the lead nurse executive um, around business, financial, strategic planning, and operational management, um, especially given those challenges uh, post-pandemic. Uh, the learning platform that was discussed already um, is really amazing. Um, we could, we were able to be adaptive based on the situation that was going on, um, move things around, um, and um, Missy loves to learn, um, so she was a sponge, um, and it also um, was able easily to be for her to actually apply them in her day to day operations, and actually applied some of those things with her team already. Yeah, I just want to give an example. I, I think folks talked about the individuality of this program. And so I just finished my doctorate and the financial management book was the book that was part of the nurse executive gateway to knowledge program. And I had just completed it with my doctorate and Deb said, okay, let's not do that. Let's talk about, let's do some research on readmissions and what that means from a financial perspective for the organization. Let's look at literature on length of stay and how that relates. How do we calculate excess stays and how do we tie dollars to that so that we can speak the language of your CFO as you're working on improvement. So I just wanted to put that out there because I saw the book and like I had post-traumatic stress and, and Deb's like, no, we're not going to read the book again. <laughs> you're graduated. Let's do something different that really matters to you. And so I just want to put that out there as you can individualize the program for the needs of uh, the executive. And you also have the ability to bring Deb on site, right? To work with one of your uh, nurse retreats and, you know, to have another pair of eyes on the prize, uh, you know, an objective viewpoint. H how did that work out? Yeah, so it was really great because we were very strategic and intentional about when Deb came on site. Um, because we wanted to make sure that it was very impactful meetings, like Chris was talking about, you know, when I'm in the room with other executives, like, what does it look like from an executive presence perspective? You know, how does the team um, refer to me, you know, from a collegiality perspective? And I think one of the things, a couple of things that Deb pointed out after the meeting is we have a very young group of uh, CNOs. I can say they were around 40. So I'm going to say that's young today. Um, CNOs in the room. And I think one of the important things for that is there was a lot of challenges of the old way, old school. Why do we put nurses on 13 hour shifts? What are we thinking differently? How can we think about care model redesign differently? And so it was really cool because the team is open to that. Um, we have great relationships. So it's psychologically safe uh, with our regional CNO team. And our chief uh, nursing executive is phenomenal. 
Um, you know, he is willing to listen. We're, we're able to bring any concerns forward. Um, and I think that was really important. And Deb got to see all of that. She got to see what type of team we had, what type of culture we had, how we, we challenge old school thinking and let's be innovative and let's think about the new generation of nurses coming in. And so we had a lot of great dialogue about that. And Deb, I don't know if you have anything else to add about that, but it, it was really important to have her here during that meeting. Oh, absolutely. That was a great meeting. And also the first time when I met members of your team, your direct reports, and had the opportunity to speak with them. Um, and I remember your whiteboard. I know every nurse executive has a whiteboard <laughs> and the whiteboard had no more space. You couldn't fit <laughs> one more letter on that board. And I remember saying to Missy, so who's working on this stuff? <laughs> She's like me, that's my list. <laughs> and so in meeting with her team, it was evident that her team, they have a great working relationship. Um, they learn a lot from Missy. But I wanted to say, Missy, how can we help them have elevate them, educate them so that they can take the whiteboard and take care of it, do it. And it was really about shifting from the tactical work that Missy can do with her eyes closed to how do you empower your team? How do you set the vision, set the expectation, give some guidance and say, you know what we need? And this is one of the, the great um, outcomes was an ambulatory nurse and advanced practice provider strategic plan. And it was beautiful. Multi they did an amazing job. And, you know, Missy was able to give them the, pass the baton to them. They came back. Um, they were able to uh, provide any revisions to that based on her feedback. But at the end of the day, they own it. It's their plan. The outcomes are going to be um, so much better because they have invested in the development of that plan. And also, it was great for Missy to see that she's now expanded her her bandwidth and bench strength to the point where now I think she has a few other uh, areas of responsibility. She's done such a great job. It was really about shifting from tactical to strategic and empowering the team. Um, and it also helps with their personal and professional growth when you're able to do that. And she continues to see that in her team. And I think that's really important, you know, in healthcare, as we're having to do less with more with less resources. And I think nurse executives are getting more responsibilities outside of nursing, which I think is great. We're, we're healthcare leaders. We may have other uh, responsibilities other than, you know, nursing care. We have to utilize our team. Like we cannot continue to do that work ourselves. You know, Deb kept coming back and she was like, why is that strategic plan not done yet? Why is that strategic plan not done? I'm like, I don't have time. Priorities keep shifting. And she's like, why is Stacy not doing that? One of my, my strongest leaders. And I was like, great question. And she did a beautiful job. So um, I just think it's really important that we, we think about that as we continue to be stretched in healthcare. It's a constant learning, isn't it? I know our audience is resonating with each of these examples. It's things I know that everybody is struggling with when to bring people in, how to empower, how to have the confidence in the team, knowing that there's going to be some missteps, how do you keep rebounding, and uh, but just some, some incredible work going on there at IU Health with, with that team. Um, now let's move. I know, Chris and Pam, you've had some similar experiences, your lived experience with our program and as uh, advisee and advisor. Chris, let's, let's delve a little bit more into your learning and your experience. So um, like, uh, like Missy, <clears throat> excuse me, like Missy, you know, we also recognized that there was a, a need to develop the team that reported to me as well. So we took, um, you know, several spheres of this program and we sort of cascaded them down towards the, the nurse leaders. So we, Pam and I co-facilitated the same program I went through with uh, the nursing directors. And then we also did the same program with the nursing leaders that reported to the directors. And then they subsequently took another team through the True North that were actually multidisciplinary. So I took other managers in our system and took them all through the True North uh, experience. So that was really um, a good exercise. And we learned a lot about where the skills of the team were. Some of the team was relatively new to me. So uh, I needed to understand where their sweet spot was. What can I help? delegate, how can I empower them to be them their best self? 
And we drove home, you need to know your business, right? Know your business be sort of came our motto, like, you know, your numbers, you know, your top DRGs, you know, your productivity inside and out. You have to speak that language and be able to manage that. Um, so they were sponges. They welcomed the opportunity because they hadn't had a structured way to do that. We promote great nurses into leaders, but they're not necessarily equipped with great leadership skills or the acumen you need to look at that. And I find that, you know, I had the experience of being very operational in the cardiovascular world. So I, I had my handle on things that way, but traditional nursing leadership, um, you know, right from the bedside into a manager, you, you, you need a little bit more structure in order to, to be successful in that realm. I don't know, Pam, you were so there. successful. You got to take on more, right? I did. <laughs> Yeah, I see that Pam smiling. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I can't go without uh, telling uh, this uh, a little bit uh, for uh, on you, Chris. I'm going to poke you a minute. Uh, when we first started working together, and Chris alluded to this, you know, uh, we both come from procedural areas, uh, critical care and OR and, and peri-op areas. And sometimes we're not in touch with our mm, true north as much, our that side of us, communication, communication styles, et cetera. So when we first started working through the true north book, I know that uh, I know Chris was rolling her eyes every once in a while and <laughs> said, uh, do we really have to do this? But what was what and, and the finance work because she worked because she was a uh, procedural leader. We oftentimes find that procedural leaders are have a higher financial acumen. So she kind of thought that wondered why, you know, did we really have to go through that book? And I said yes. And but what was wonderful to see is that yes, there were new things that we learned. And and she learned things about herself through that true north journey. She learned things uh through the finance journey, but what was even more rewarding is then to co-teach that, as she said, she and I, so we, we worked together for six months in sphere one and sphere two, Chris and I, and then she said, I want to work tandem with you in bringing sphere one and sphere two to the rest of the team. So we co-taught or co-led, co-facilitated sphere one and sphere two with her manager, nurse leader team. And that was uh, so rewarding in a couple of ways because then Chris really was vulnerable with that team. And again, remember she's new. She's a new leader to them in this role. And she was vulnerable in saying, when Pam and I first started doing this, I didn't think that I was going to like this True North book. I didn't think I was going to learn anything about myself. I didn't think that I was, I needed to know my communication style. But she was able to say to the team, I have found this work really important and we're going to do it together. And um, she facilitated those, that work through that just beautifully. And we spent the next six months together doing a fil facilitating that work with her team and then Chris I don't know if you want to talk about the the cul culmination of it all when you held uh, the congress yeah so um, part of this was making sure that you know now that we've had all this uh, teaching we wanted to make sure that nursing was aligned with all the strategic goals of the organization right so we held our first uh, nursing congress which we did an assessment um, to see where our gaps were and then how we could align better with the organization. And we came out of Congress with imperatives, things that we were going to do. Um, and each year since then, we redo the assessment and have a different set of imperatives uh, that are completely aligned with the organization. So it, it, people can see the connection from the floor, then the nurses all the way to the strategic uh, goals. So that's worked out really well. And that's, I, you know, my goal was to be, uh, you know, the vice president for a year or two and then be promoted to the CNO and which I did right on the two year mark. So that was good. Um, so now having some oversight of all the other uh, 
facilities in our, our organization was a, a huge, uh, I felt really proud of that going through the program, being able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And to see that the framework is so flexible and adaptable to your individual. You, you were new to the role, but didn't they call you the grand dame of your organization because yeah. you had the most tenure of anybody there, right? Yes. Our entire senior team, I have the most tenure in the hospital. Yes. Right. And yet you were new in a role. And and, yeah. and I know you've, you've told me over this span of time that, you know, a lot of times you get into these roles and you don't have a safe haven. Right. You don't have that trusted confidant that has that objective view. So that's what I know Pam provided provided you throughout the process. And I know you you did some journaling throughout the process as well. There's your <laughs> journal. Uh-huh. I wanted to make sure I under, you know, I wanted to capture the feelings I was having in the beginning and what I was doing in some notes and hints for myself and then look back on it and say, you know, I have come, I've yeah. come a, a distance away from where I was. So yeah. And I know Missy, you had quite an experience with the true north component of the program as well. Yeah, so I really like the True North. Um, and I like the piece where it made you go through your personal professional journey. So, you know, thinking about, um, you know, my story and specifically looking at crucibles. So what events in your career really shaped who you are? And I think I had, you know, two spots in my career where I applied for positions and didn't get them. And mm -hmm. now I coach people that that's okay, because that's really where I pivoted. Um, you know, I, I didn't get a role as a flight nurse at the beginning of my career as an ER nurse. And that's what every ER nurse wants to do is fly. But it, it pushed me to be an acute care MP. And I've been an MP for 17 years and lots of leadership opportunity in that advanced practice role. And, you know, I applied for an operations role and, and didn't get that position. That's OK, because now I have the system opportunity where I'm looking, working with 16 hospitals, looking at length of stay, readmissions, trying to figure out how to influence the regional teams from a leadership perspective, but not being the executor, right? I don't do the work. I set the vision, I set the targets, I set the financial goals, and I really help with best practices. I share best practices across the system, but I don't do the work, which is hard for me as an old ER trauma person, right? I don't do the work. So how do you achieve those outcomes when you're not the one doing the work, but providing enough support so those teams know that you can help remove barriers? I think we're really critical things that I learned in my journey. And, and we had a couple incidents where, where Deb and I worked through some difficult challenges where, you know, I'm in this new role and I really wasn't brought into some discussions. You know, we had a program close um, that was led by advanced practice and I, I didn't know about it. Um, I, I didn't know about it till, you know, it was, it already happened. And so talking to those teams to say, hey, these are the situations where you can bring me in and bring me in early and I'm happy to provide support. And um, you know, I think it's just building trust um, with these teams in a large healthcare system. It can be challenging. And yeah. I think if you don't um, have the ability to communicate well, people don't trust you and you can't lead through influence, you are not going to survive in a healthcare system, mm -hmm. uh, especially a large one. And so Deb and I had a lot of those conversations where I, a lot of times I knew the answer, Deb, you're right, but I had to talk through it with her. And then I had another situation that, that was very similar, but I handled it very differently uh, because of my conversations with Deb. And so I think that's really important, um, having that advisor. And, and it sounds like Chris and Pam still talk, and Deb and I text a lot, too, about <laughs> what's going on with Deb. She knows about my daughter's wedding. Uh, so it's just really neat that those relationships are, are everlasting. Well, isn't ours... Everything we do is relational. I, I love the fact that we build these lifelong friendships and colleagueships and allyships that do sustain us through growth, through improvement, through change, both personally and professionally. And that's something we're, we're so proud to be able to facilitate and enable through this program. So let's talk for a few minutes about results. I know there's people in the audience right now that saying, wow, this sounds great. You got some great resources, some great colleagueship. What results are you able to achieve through this program? So maybe uh, Missy and, and, and uh, Debbie, you want to start out with some of the true accomplishments that you've seen? I know there've been financial as well as team related and, and colleague related ones. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I am so proud of Missy. Um, transitioning to be able to lead with influence is huge. Um, in a very large health system, a lot of matrix reporting, a lot of personalities and everything else. Um, but also being able to identify, you know, who needs to be at the table? Who can I call on? You know, do I have everyone that I need there? 
uh, to achieve what what we set out to do. And I think one of her biggest accomplishments, and she's had many, was um, the fact of not having any direct inpatient responsibility, but having to impact length of stay and patient throughput. Um, her, her focus areas of responsibility is ambulatory, her day-to-day -day oversight, um, but she had a large financial goal, $50 million goal. And um, as someone with no direct supervision, she was able to accomplish that. Uh, $50 million goal reduction, um, also decreased length of stay. And it was through the influence and empowering members of her team, not her doing it, guiding, being the barrier buster, and helping them to come up with the strategies, thinking about what, how do we reach this financial and not lose sight of the quality of care that we're also giving? Wonderful. I think that's what her, her Wonderful. Yeah, Missy, any other specific accomplishments? Yeah, Missy, yeah, other accomplishments? Chris, yeah. You know, I, I don't journal because <laughs> I have five kids at home too, but I, I, do, I do short accomplishments for the year. And I think <laughs> taking that time to reflect and what did, what did I accomplish in 2023? You know, Deb talked about the financial stuff, but I, I promoted a couple uh, of my leaders. I've developed a new a medical assistant program where, you know, half, 99 people applied for 12 spots and 40% were black and all of them were entry level positions, all wanting to develop within the health system into a medical assistant role. Those are the things that make me proud is, you know, how do I develop my director of my medical assistant program so she can make that happen? Um, I think is really cool. Building coalitions. So how do I make my directors of advanced practice providers stronger in the regions and and develop their leadership skills so that they can execute on the strategic plan for advanced practice? How do I get my directors of ambulatory nursing practice, you know, the skills that they need to lead the medical group and all the clinical teams in the clinics? And so that is what makes me the proudest. And I think that I got from this program, um, really thinking about how do I deselect work on my plate so that I could do the things that are really important, um, like strategic thinking and, and vision setting and and, and really um, developing people instead of executing on the day-to-day -day work. Such an, such an important takeaway. Uh, Chris and Pam together, I know you've been together through thick and thin, you mm -hmm. piloted the program for us. What are some of the key takeaways as far as the results that you've seen? You've, you've transformed really an entire leadership organization. Yes, I, I think um, most importantly, I think development of the leadership team is, is key. I recently had um, promoted two, three of those nurse leaders that I did into director positions. Uh, so that was a great thing for them. It was a nice um, way to show internal progression in the organization in a, in a way because most of our leadership positions were coming from out of state. So uh -huh. after you see that time and time again, you wonder if there's every room for you, right? So we wanted to make sure that we internally promoted those nursing directors. And I think that that was great. And, and Missy, I don't journal anymore. I did that for that one stint of nine months. I, you know, <laughs> that would not be me, right, Pam? I, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> but it was important at the time. It was, it was important at the time. Progress. But I think between that and the nursing con Congress and staying, always staying aligned with what, this, what the organization needs mm -hmm. and what we're trying to all strive for. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Pam? I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just add on to a couple of those. The reason why one of the reasons why those nurse leaders were ready for director positions is because of the work that Chris did with her team and leading them through the True North, having them prepare their own financial uh, monthly operating reports. The work that she did with them in 21 uh, enabled them then to be prepared for those uh, director positions when they came open in 22. So I don't want to lose sight of that. That That is why those leaders mm -hmm. were able to be promoted mm -hmm. and that succession plan internally. And, and then for uh, the CEOs that may be joining us, we, uh, as a CEO, we always want to ensure that our nursing division, patient care services division is uh, meeting is that what they're working on is going to help the whole organization meet their goals. 
And what Chris worked on with her team in that nursing Congress is yes, here's the organization's goals and let's make that specific to how does nursing impact these goals? How do we at a unit level impact these goals? So it really transforms the whole organization. So we're, real, we're all working towards the same, uh, the same goals. And that's what those imperatives were. And, you know, Chris didn't give herself enough credit. She set up quarterly meetings, quarterly touch bases after that nursing Congress so that everyone reported out so that everybody knew, you know, kept it front and center what you talk about, uh, your team knows is important. And at the end of uh, 2021 or 2022, they had met all those imperatives. Well, this is just so wonderful to hear these results, very tangible financial results, which everybody has to prove every day, team related, internal career progression, which is in and of itself can be a very fruitful financial decision to be made by organizations. So that's wonderful. And I'm glad to hear that the program has been able to be molded in such a way that it can suit the needs of different individuals at different points in time and to continue to grow with each of you. So let's do a quick last round, Robin, for some maybe parting words of wisdom. And then we've got a couple of questions from the audience to get to. Deb, you want to share a few parting comments, words of wisdom for us? Thank you so much. I truly believe that this is a collaborative approach, sharing knowledge, building sustainable systems that can be adapted um, ever for this ever-evolving healthcare landscape. Um, it's about creating a culture of continuous improvement and learning. Through my advisor role, I believe that I've been able to work closely with Missy to build relationships, to navigate challenges, to implement best practices and evidence-based practice. Um, empower the team and ultimately enhance patient care and impact the bottom line. Love that. Thank you so much, Deb. Pam? Yeah, I, I, I look at this as I supported. Uh, we collaborated together. And my goal was to leave Chris with the tools to do her job and to be independent. Uh, not that I don't love it when she still calls me and says, hey, can I run something by you? <laughs> but uh, I really, my goal was to to leave her in a good space. And I think we accomplished that. Absolutely. Chris, you can speak to that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I still will call her. You just gave me an opening for that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it, I think I agree with Deb with the continuous learning journey. And, you know, it not every day is perfect right? You might still have a setback or two, but we all, you know, you forgive yourself. I think that's what I learned is forgive yourself, make a better choice next time and, and, and humbly accept and own that in that space. So I appreciate the journey. And I, I, I said from the, when I met with Colleen, it's probably the best thing I was ever oh. privileged to take part of. So it was Wonderful. a very good journey. And I, I appreciate Pam for everything she's done. That's been our pleasure. Missy, final Pearl. I would say let your team know what you're doing because you're, you're going to change and they want to know why. You know, if I don't <laughs> attend all the meetings or I don't respond to all the emails before somebody on my team, let them know that you're trying something different and mm -hmm. so that they know you're still engaged and supportive, but uh, that bring them along with your journey. I think that transparency speaks to how you've all been so successful, the vulnerability that you've shown, the transparency. So thank you all so much. But we've got a couple of really pretty easy questions to answer here from our audience, so we can do that. Uh, Robert is asking to share the title of the book you referenced about Humble Inquiry. <laughs> it's The Art of Humble Inquiry by Edgar Schein. Mm -hmm. Schein. Great. Yep. Thank you so much. And then Chantel is asking, what are the requirements to be in this program? Do you recommend that a nurse goes through this while in grad school? Who wants to take that one? The requirements, I can say from Kirby Bates, because it's our program, the, the requirements are give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about where you are in your leadership journey and what your organization needs. And then what we do is we match up, and you can see it works beautifully. We match up the advisee with the perfect advisor. And uh, we're really pretty good at it. So uh, give us a call. That's one thing. And then I know, Missy, you were in doctoral program. I mean, do you, did the advisor suggest doing a program such as this while in grad school? That's what Chantel's asking. 
Well, I finished it after my, I, I did this right after my doctorate. I think you can do it. Um, but I, it, it just depends on what other things you have going on in your life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, it, it's a pretty easy program to do. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's a time commitment, but I got 80 uh, continuing education hours for doing it. Well, I was just going to say, that's our last question here is um, how do the advisees get contact hours for participating? If so, how many? And the answer there is yes. This is an accredited program. You get contact hours. It depends on the program that you model for your needs. But Chris, you got 65 contact hours through it. Missy, you said 80, right? So yes, absolutely. So I see we're at the three o'clock hour. Please just um, let me say how much I value and appreciate each of the colleagues that shared their time getting ready for this and delivering such important message, messages today. Pam, Chris, Missy, Deb, you are stars. I am honored to, to call you friends and colleagues. And we sure hope to ever, the hundreds of you who've been on with us this afternoon, we hope this was meaningful to you and you can take some of these pearls of wisdom and apply them in your setting so that we are always getting better every day so that we can all take better care of patients and communities. So thanks from all of us at Kirby Bates and give us a holler. We'd love to help you too. Thanks and have a great day, everybody.